Jesus the light shine on us. <clears throat> Jesus the teacher help us to listen. Jesus the healer put your hands on us. Jesus the amazing one help us to stick with you as you walk to your cross and to your glory. In Jesus name. Amen. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope today you are going to enjoy what God is going to say to our hearts and uh, speaking through the word of God, through the sharing of the word of God, through the prayers. I hope God is going to impart something in our lives. May God bless you. Let us pray. Wondrous God, we approach you this day with all and as we think about you, your glory and your greatness, we know ourselves created in your image, yet fallible human beings. We come to adore and worship you today. Create in us, open us, minds and souls, that our worship and praise may encourage and strengthen us. Show your greatness and glory to the world. Empower us with your spirit. Fill us with your love as we reflect and share your love and care. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> I would ask Brother Ben to come forward and read the word of God. Amen. Good morning and God bless. Another wonderful day. Uh, I just encourage us to get in and read the word and uh, seek out its truths and uh, just grow in it. It's um, such an amazing thing. Anyway, we're going to read from Luke 9 28 to 43. And it's about Jesus is transfigured on the mountain. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James and John with him and went up to the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance on his face changed and his clothes become as bright as the flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring fulfilment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I beg your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Praise God. Uh, it's going to be a great message. <coughs> Johnson always brings great messages and great teachings. So we'll uh, get him back to share with us his word of the, the word of God for this week. Thank you, Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, I've thought of sharing with you on the theme, Life in the Valley. Life in the Valley. The story of the transfiguration is one of those messages that have given the phrase mountaintop experience to our language. Peter, James, and John has joined Jesus and escaped from the crowd for some spiritual rest and recreation up in the wilderness of probably Mount Hermon. Night had fallen and their eyes were heavy. Sullen when they walk with a start, just yonder they saw Jesus taking on something of a supernatural glow. His face and clothes and brightest flash of lightning in Luke 9 verse 29. Then Moses and Elijah appeared and spoke with the master. And to had come, this had been the greatest lawgiver and the greatest prophet. On the mountaintop, in the presence of the glory, Peter said, Master, is it good for us to be here? On verse 33. Then he wanted to build three shrines to honor this great man. You would just as soon have stayed there. Life is so much better, so much nearer to God on the mountaintop. Why ever come down? That was his thinking. Now, no one could see anything. A fog, a cloud, and settled around them. Scary. Suddenly, a voice projected from the cloud. This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. On verse 35, as quickly as they had come, the cloud, Moses and Elijah were gone. So the event confirmed for the disciples, if they had any lingering doubts, that Jesus, whom they had come to love and trust, was more than a man, he was divine. This was a mountaintop experience, if there was one. Now, Peter really wanted to stay. Is it possible we want to preserve those mountaintop experiences? We want to stay here. Is it possible for us to build three tabernacles, even they were scared, even they were scared a little, but they wanted to build something so that they can stay up the mountain, not going down, because the experience was so good to them. But the story continued. They came down from the mountain, back to life in the valley. So that's why I have given my sermon, Life in the Valley, the theme. In the words of Psalm, is the valley of dark shadows, the valley of the shadow of death. Remember, even though I walk through the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death, the valley is where we have all these skeletons. The dead bones are in the valley. This is where we get all these things. Who can blame Peter for not wanting to return to this? But Christianity says it. It is of the very essence of life that we must come down. We must come down to meet those people who are the marginalized, the poor, the nobody. Those are the people we come to. William Buckley, that a wonderful New Testament scholar from Scotland, knows that in religion there must be solitude. But there must not be solitariness. His, the solitude is necessary for one must keep in contact with God. Where you are on your own, you can go up the mountain on your own to pray. You can go out in the desert on your own to pray. You can go away on your own, in a closet on your own. Those times are needed. But if we, in our search for solitude, shut ourselves from one another, then we're not doing good. We should never shut ourselves from anyone. If we shut our ears to the appeal of our brothers and sisters for help, if we shut our hearts to the cries and tears of things, then that is not religion. That is not Christianity. Christianity never wants us to shut ourselves from other people. It wants us to interact with them. It wants us to meet their needs. That is what it asks us. So the solitude is not meant to make us solitary. It means, it is meant to make us better able to meet and cope with the demands of everyday life. So Jesus understood that the gospel gave him regularly retreating for solitude. 
Now he's back with the people. He's back in the valley with the people. A father had brought his epileptic son to the disciples. And the disciples had been quite unable to deal with it. Jesus said to bring the boy. One last fierce convulsion gripped him. And this is what happened. So the boy fell to the ground. The foam still on his mouth. The mouth is still open. The eyes still fixed and sharing. According to the parallel account in Mark's gospel, there was no movement, no sign of life on this boy. Think about it. There was no movement, no sign of life. Let's say you've gone to the hospital to pray with someone else. And people ask you to pray. Or maybe ask you to pray. And after your prayers, there is no sign of movement in the person you prayed for. What will the people think? They think, oh, your prayer has killed our relative. Your prayer has done something. So the silent the people in the crowd pressing around must have looked over the shoulders of Jesus. And the anxious father saw the boy lying there, straight motionless on the ground. No one was speaking. At length, one whispered to the person next to him, he has cured him, but he has killed him. That boy is dead. That boy is dead. The others looked wondering down on the lead and at length, speaking openly now and exclaimed, the boy is dead. He has cured him, but he has killed him. In Mark 9 verse 26. Then a scribe recovering his old boldness and arrogance remarked to one of his fellows, yes, he has cured him, but he has killed him. This is what I think was going on. What sort of cure is that? We could have done that ourselves. We could have knocked the boy on the head and that would have been the end of it. What sort of a physician or a prophet is it? This anyway. You can see the face of the father as he looked at Jesus, stayed on him on the prostrate form, the expressionless face of the boy. You can go, you can see him turn back to Jesus and hear him say, Master, you have cast out the evil spirit, but I'm afraid the boy is dead. And yet, Master, I think I would rather have him lying there motionless and dead than see him torn anymore by those fearful conversions. Instead of being carried away by the experience or his importance or being distracted by the huge crowd that met him at the foot of the mountain, Jesus took the time to notice one man in his demon-possessed son. He noticed one person with his demon-possessed son. He cared enough about these seemingly insignificant people to listen and respond to their problem. And with the tremendous events of cosmic magnitude playing out around him, do you notice the little people in your life? Do you notice the little people in your life like Jesus? Do you have a place in your heart and your schedule for seemingly insignificant ones who desperately need to know that someone cares about them? There are people walking and sometimes they we see them as less human beings who needs our attention. Insignificant people. Ask God if there's someone, even someone insignificant in your world's eyes who needs your attention and compassion. That is what Jesus did. He was not distracted about what happened up on the mountain. That he, he heard the voice coming that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He is not distracted by that. He goes to the people who are less privileged. The insignificant people. Insignificant father. The demon possessed people. Those are the people he attend to. So this entire scene is a picture of today. Jesus has passed on to the glory. His disciples were with him. We are down here in this world at the foot of the mountain where there is confusion. Where we are living. There is compromise. There is importance. The world today is, acts like a demon-possessed man. The world we are living. And the church is the hopeless in the presence of the world's needs. Where is the church? Where are we? To meet the needs of the world. Because it is the world today that is acting like a demon-possessed person. 
and it needs us. When Jesus spoke to the crowd, he rebuked them for their lack of faith concerning this boy and apparently the disciples and the skeptics were included. So the condition of this boy was pitiful. Jesus turned to the father and asked him to believe. Just believe. But of course the boy was not dead. The boy was not dead. Mark's gospel says Jesus took him by the hand. I, I, like, I like that one. He took him by the hand, lifted him up and gave him back to his father. In Mark 9 verse 27. He took him by the hand. Isn't that great? He took him by the hand. When Jesus healed the woman who was almost dead with a fever, he took her by the hand. When Jesus healed the blind man, he took him by the hand. When he cleansed the leper, he tied him with his hand. When he restored the daughter of Jairus to her father and mother, he took her by the hand. That was the way Jesus worked, the laying of hands. There is power in the hand of Jesus Christ. There is healing in the hand of Jesus Christ. There is great power to cast out demons in the hand of Jesus Christ. He took him by the hand. That is very important. Clarence Martin, that great preacher of an earlier generation, used this to say Jesus' gospel was the gospel of the encouraging, the sympathizing, the healing hand. It can be your gospel too. You can preach it in the church from Sunday to Sunday, or you can preach it anywhere you happen to be. He come, those who are lonely. Here comes those who are lonely, who need the hand of God. Give them the hand of friendship. Those who are lonely, those who have no one to talk to, give them the hand of friendship. Give them a call. Talk to them. Here come those who are doubting. Give them the hand of God with, so that they cannot doubt anymore. Here come those who have drunk deeply from the cup of sorrow and pain. Give them the hand of sympathy. Here come those who are weighed down under the unseen burden. Give them the help to uplift the burden that they are carrying. They need your hand. They need your hand. Give them the hand of strength. Here come those who are pursued by some dangerous temptation. Give them the hand of fortitude. Here are those who have needs of physical sustenance. Give them the hand of generosity. Give them food. Give them something. Preach the gospel that Christ preached. Martina says, the gospel of the hand. It is the gospel of the hand. The gospel of the hand. Mountain, tip, ex, mountain top experiences are wonderful. Still life is lived in the valley. But life is lived in the valley. Mountain top experiences, they are really good. But life is right in the valley. There are people among us who continue to struggle with their own private demons. You don't know them, but they are struggling. Some battle grief and despair. Some struggle to overcome addiction. Life in the valley can be tough. But for Peter, James, and John, after that moment on the mountain, the valley would never be the same again. Would never be the same again. It would never be the same again. Why? Because now they were also glowing. Because the Holy Spirit now was with them also. They would now perform those miracles. That day on the mountain, that moment in the close presence of God, change those men just as those moments in worship. Moments when we feel especially near can change you and me. When you feel you are now closer to God, those moments can change you. They can change you to be somebody. You don't need to follow other people. You need to follow Jesus Christ. You don't need to follow other people. You need to follow God. That is what is important. There are people who are hooked by following people. They are following theories. They are following whatever philosophies. Follow Jesus Christ. That is the person. With Peter, James, and John, we have a glimpse of the future. And the eyes of faith will have been a better day. Praise God, oh God, from whom all blessings come. A better day is coming. The future is there. Why? Because God is in control. 
He is in charge. When you are going right into the valley, that know yourself that you are not moving on your own. You are moving with God. He is with you. God is with you. So don't fear what is happening in the valley. That is what we have been called for. We have not been called to stay up the mountaintop. We have been called to stay in the valley. We are in the world, but not of the world. That is what we have been called. To help the people whose needs are really tremendous. Whose needs some people can even not even look at. They need your eyes to look at. They need your hand to help them. May God help you as you think upon these ways. That you are the person. You are the person who has been called by God to work down in the valley. Where things sometimes go wrong. He's the God of the mountain. He's still the God of the valley. When things go wrong, he's always there. May God bless you all. May God help you to understand your call. Knowing that you've been called to spend your life in the valley. With the people less privileged. The disadvantaged. The insignificant. The nobody. God has called you to do that. In Jesus name. Amen. Let us pray. As we come today weighed down with care, we come today rejoicing with others, we come today with aches and pain, we come today thankful for our riches, we come today to meet one another in the presence of God, who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We bring all that we are, our joy, our sadness, at the altar of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can help us. He is the only one who can sustain us. God, thank you that as we journey with you, you are transforming us. Thank you for the mountaintop experiences as well as the everyday journeys. As we ask you to know your presence and your power as we live each day for you, Father. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, brothers and uh, sisters, it's time now we think of also what we can do. I know sometimes it's difficult, but I'm asking you to remember your creator. Remember to thank God always with whatever you have. Because all the gifts that we have, they come from him. Without God, nothing, nothing at all. All that we have comes from you. So it's time for you now just to think on the ways you can say thank you, Lord. You can say thank you, Lord. Okay, let us pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we want to thank you for all the gifts you have given us. We want to thank you for all the material things that we have in our lives. We want to thank you for the gift of life. We want to thank you for being there for us and our families. Father, bless us. May you continue, Lord Jesus Christ, to look upon us. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you to meet you, to radiate your glory. May we have shared today in Weden and to shine with the acknowledge of your love that others see and come to know you. May you bless us, Father. Bless us, Lord Jesus Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us from now and evermore. Amen. I want to thank you all. God bless you.